So can I welcome you to uh, Lansdowne Church here at Woodbury Avenue for this uh, special uh, Thanksgiving service for the life of James Timothy Lewis. We are together, all ages, and it's uh, especially uh, lovely to have some of the children with us. They'll be taking part later in, in our service, but there's a provision for them in the hall and in the creche room uh, if they get a little bit boisterous and noisy. And there are already several children and their mums and dads out there uh, now. So welcome to you all. We share, of course, in this service with, with Nikki and Ed and Imogen, with, with their family and, and, and their friends. And, and it may feel a little bit unusual, perhaps even confusing, because we're not just reaching out to Ed and, and Nikki and Imogen in, in their loss. We're actually expressing our thanks for the life of a person we never knew, a, a baby whose cry we never heard and, and whose smile we never saw. Yet James had a life, 38 and a half weeks of it on earth, entirely within the womb of, of his mother. And he has a life now in heaven, in the presence of the God who, who created him, who knows and loves him. But we will come with questions. Questions that maybe arise from our own experience or those of others that we know. Questions about the fragility of life and the, the goodness of God. And I hope that we'll connect with some of that during the elements of our service today. For me, I've been helped as I've prepared for uh, our time together as I read these words from an anthology of readings for occasions like this. If you come in certainty or confusion, in anger or in anguish, this time is for us. If you come in silent suffering or hidden sorrow, out of your pain or because you promised, this time is for us. If you come for your own or another's need, for a private wound or the wounds of the world, this time is for us. If you come and you are not sure why, to be here is enough. This time is for us. Come now, Christ, of the forgiving warmth, of the yearning tears, of the transforming touch. This time is for you. So to our first hymn, it's based upon the response of Mary to the surprising news that she was to be a mother. Tell out my soul, the greatness of the Lord in our order of service, the first hymn, and we stand to sing.
And let's join together in prayer. Lord God, you are great, glorious, often mysterious, but always loving in your purposes. So as we speak to you in prayer, we speak also to ourselves, to our souls, about your glory and love. And we want to tell that glory to our children too, and our children's children. We want to tell of your love to James Timothy Lewis for the gift whose brief life we thank you. We want to tell that to Nikki and Ed and Imogen and to each other. For in the midst of profound sadness, we can find profound joy at the heart of our pain. The discovery of your mercy from age to age, the same, awaits us. And so today we pray that you will draw near to James' parents, his sister and family in their loss. May the promises of your word be the fuel of their comfort and ours. May they be able to rejoice in God their Savior and we with them. May they find you to be the one who having given your only son to die for us is able to save them and us from despair and the fear of death. Lord Jesus, we take comfort by the display of your love for little ones when you lived on earth. And we praise you that James is free from the sorrows of this life and safe in your tender keeping. Assure our hearts that all is well with this child. And may heaven seem nearer to us and the realities of this world less important. And as we reflect today and share this experience with each other, hold us in your grace and peace. We ask these things in the name of him who is the friend of sinners and little ones too, our Lord Jesus. Amen. So we join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer on our order of service, and we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're going to follow now a series of Bible readings. The words are on your order of service. And on the screen, as we go through the readings, will appear some images to illustrate them. After the second reading, we're going to see a video telling James' life story from the point of view of his mum and sister in particular. We read from Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. 
A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Yes, he has. He's 37 weeks now he's been in my tummy. 37 weeks. Letting go of every single dream. I lay each one down. Changes what you see. I've tried to win this war.
Isn't that great? I think we've discovered a, a talent for the future, a singing and dancing talent. Imogen, you were wonderful. Thank you. And we've discovered a great creative uh, video producer as well in Dad. That was very touching. So to our third reading from Matthew's Gospel in your order of service. Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety and nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Well, we're going to sing again now, a song with its powerful reminder to trust that God is the shepherd who loses none of his sheep and who in Jesus, the good shepherd, lays down his own life for them. We stand and sing together, the Lord's my shepherd.
again take your seats and it's time now for some reflections from the family and the children are going to take part and then we'll have some prayers as well thank you Nikki this new year our family began a blessings jar an idea I took from my friend Angie where each member of the family writes down different things they are thankful for during the year. I put my first blessing in our jar just after seeing in the new year on the 1st of January, and it said how thankful I was for Ed and our beautiful little girl Imogen, and for baby James Timothy still growing inside me. My labor began minutes later. I was glad to have been able to carry James almost to full term and for the support we were given by all the medical staff to do this. He surprised them all by getting to 38 weeks, although as a family we always had a sense that he would be with us for Christmas, and he was, albeit yet unborn. I've shared the story with a few of you about how Imogen used to pray quite often for a little brother or sister over the years, and there was one day over a year ago when she said to me when, that when we were praying, Jesus told her that he had run out of autumn babies, but he was going to give us one at Christmas. Ed and I had been letting go of the possibility of having another child, but it was such a profound thing to say, age three, that I didn't forget it. Though we had been prepared for the high possibility of James dying during labor, we were both deeply sad when this happened as we had such faith that we would get to spend some time with him, even if only minutes. I don't think we will ever get over that feeling of love and heartbreak mixed together when we saw him for the first time, wishing he could have survived the birth so that we could tell him how much we loved him, though I think he knew. Reaching five pounds and looking so peaceful somehow made it feel more possible that he could have lived a bit longer, which increases the longing and the pain that he wasn't well enough for that. And the heartache is not only about losing our baby. It's losing the first smile, first steps, first day at school, the boy and the man he would have become, finding out what his gifts and qualities would have been. Yet our love for James is so strong that we will always be grateful for every second we had with him. When my brother Pete was praying for us on New Year's Day at the start of my labor, he told me he had a picture of James smiling and doing that little chuckle that babies do. He thinks it expressed James's joy, which he will have now in heaven, though Pete had longed for him to be able to share that joy with us in this life. But he said to me that James did share so much love and joy with the three of us as I carried him, and I love that thought. Imogen used to tell me that James was laughing when she tickled him in my tummy, and maybe he was. James's great-grandma Lewis and his great-auntie Audrey, who were sisters-in-law, both died at the end of last year, just a few weeks before he did, both aged 98 the last in that generation of Lewis's. At Auntie Audrey's funeral, my father-in-law Gerald said these words, God's timing is perfect. Auntie Audrey often said, why am I left here in this life for so long? Gerald was sure that it was to be a witness to our savior God's grace. For James, our question is, why was he taken so soon? God knew how wanted James was, how much we'd have loved him, and how much his big sister longed for him to stay with us, to grow up in our family. So we are left with a lot of whys. Probably the hardest for me is when Imogen asks us, why didn't Jesus make James better? Or even answer my important prayer to have just one cuddle before he took James to heaven. I can't answer this for her. But I always come back to the verse from Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I know that all our prayers were heard and one day we will understand why we didn't get the answers we desperately hoped for. 
God is good and we can trust him, even when, perhaps especially when, we don't understand his ways. Following the diagnosis of Edwards syndrome at our 20-week scan, our decision to look after and love our precious little boy for as long as we were able to was a choice we have remained peaceful with throughout. We knew that the situation was too big for us to control, but we had security in knowing that God was in control. We had to prepare ourselves for the likelihood of James dying in utero at any point in the pregnancy. Yet each time we saw him still growing and developing on the scans, I would feel God isn't finished yet. Over the weeks, we felt a real sense of joy and hope alongside the pain. And I know that this was in no small part due to the support and prayers of all of you here and our family who can't make it today as well, as you have loved and held us as a family and continue to do so. And we are so thankful. God knew this precious life would be short, and he chose us to be James' family. Although we have more questions than we have answers, the following words from my brother three days before James was born have been a real encouragement. He said, God has been able to give you such a special life as James's because he trusts you to cherish him and bless him. You have both done this as you do for Imogen. I am sure that he felt every cuddle we gave him, every tender kiss from his sister and her tickles. He heard our words of love, our prayers, our songs. By Christmas, Imogen had developed a strong bond with him. Their relationship was beautiful. He responded most to her voice. One of my favorite times of the day was reading a story to, with Imogen at bedtime and saying prayers together with her and James cuddled up close on my lap, feeling them both at the same time. I think James enjoyed stories too, because even if he'd had a quiet day, he nearly always began moving during story time. One evening, Imogen toppled off my lap as my bump was getting so big. She laughed and said, you're a cheeky little James. You push me off mummy's lap. Another fun time was swimming in the big waves at Alam Chine Beach last September holding Imogen as she squealed with excitement, James with us too. We miss James so very much, but he'll always be part of, of the family times which Ed, Imogen and I will enjoy in the future because he left an imprint on our lives that lives on here, even though he's in heaven. I like the thought of the following image written by another mother who lost her baby. Some say that time in heaven is compared to the blink of an eye for us on this earth. Sometimes it helps me to think of my child running ahead of me through a beautiful field of wildflowers and butterflies, so happy and completely caught up in what he's doing that by the time he turns to see if I'm behind him, I will be. Life is so precious for however long we have it. James was alive for the months we carried him, and he's alive now in heaven. One day we will be together again. For now, we carry him in our hearts.
Um, a poem that Ed and Nikki have chosen to be read today is called Little Snowdrop. The world may never notice if a snowdrop doesn't bloom or even pause to wonder if the petals fall too soon. But every life that ever forms or ever comes to be touches the world in some small way for all eternity. The little one we longed for was swiftly here and gone, but the love that was then planted is a light that still shines on. And though our arms are empty, our hearts know what to do. For every beating of our hearts says that, James, we love you. Let's pray together. Almighty Father, God and Creator, we thank you for the gift of life. Thank you that because of your love, you chose to make us in your image. We thank you for your presence with us and your grace to us throughout our lives. We thank you that you know us from our earliest moment to our last. We thank you for the life of James and that through your grace and mercy, he is safe with you. Thank you that through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus, you give new life to all who call on you. We ask that we will hear and respond to your call on our lives to follow you and share in eternal life. Amen. Lord God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we thank you that we can find comfort in your living word. Thank you that you promise you will never leave us or abandon us, and that nothing in life or death can separate us from your love in Jesus Christ. We pray for Ed, Nikki, Imogen, and all of James's family, that they will know and experience the depth and strength of your love. We ask that your perfect peace will continue to surround and fill them, as you have already been blessing and sustaining them over the last months and days. Thank you for showing your truth and reality through Ed, Nikki, and Imogen's faith in you and their witness to us all. Thank you for your faithfulness to all your children, each of whom you know by name. Amen. Well, let's sing again, shall we? Uh, a hymn of confidence, Christian assurance, that our hope is built upon nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We stand and, and sing together. Jesus Christ. 
this attack. You know that uh, when, when you're a pastor uh, in a fairly large church, inevitably you can't get to know everyone that well. A welcome or a goodbye at the church door is about as far as it gets most weeks. But then something happens. Something happens to change all of that. A big life event, a complicated issue. And you are drawn as a pastor much deeper into the storyline of, of an individual or, in this case, a family. It is one of the greatest privileges, actually, of Christian ministry. I get to teach the Bible, that's good, but I also get to share the heartaches and the high points, the sorrows and the joys of, of people's lives. And that has been my experience with, with Ed and Nikki and Imogen. Because, you see, until a few months ago, a friendly hello uh, on, on a Sunday or a goodbye was about as good it was, as it was ever likely to get then something happened to change all that. Someone happened. James Timothy Lewis. Uh, and among the questions that we all have where James is concerned, one thing is clear to me. Because of him, I've come to know and love his parents and his little sister. I don't think I'm alone in that experience either. Because his fragile life has has connected lots of us at a deeper level. James touched us, and we have reached out to touch each other as a result. And one of the major reasons for that, Ed and Nikki, has been because of your remarkably open and courageous way in which you have allowed us to share the journey with you. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, for me personally, the journey began the moment that having heard the diagnosis of Edwards syndrome, you decided not to terminate the pregnancy but to ask for prayer and the strength to carry the baby for as, as long as God wanted you to. And it was the journey which, uh, for me, culminated in Poole Maternity Hospital when early on that morning, January the 3rd, Sean and I came to be with you in your tears. And there we looked at baby James and we wondered at his beautiful feet and hands and nose. So how do we begin to make sense of all of that, eh? What can we say to each other? Well, I want to take the, the single Bible verse which, which Ed and Nikki selected and they've placed it towards the end of, of your printed order of service. I want to take that as a helpful starting point from which to reflect as we draw to a close. The text, as you can see, uh, comes from the writings of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter, chapter 49 and verse 1. The Lord called me before my birth from within the womb. He called me by name. Two things, I think, in particular, arise from that verse. Here's the first. The mystery of life. Now, the debate in our culture, in our Western culture, regarding when and how we, we define the beginning of life, will, I have no doubt, continue and rage on. But that text changes dramatically some of the key reference points. Actually, the more science and technology advances in this area of fetal development, the more that text and the words of, of David from Psalm 139, which Sean read earlier, begin to ring true. David says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. The mystery of life. Now, we can argue, and we have a, an eminent consultant with us here today, so we can argue about the exact moment. Is it conception, fertilization, implantation? But we now know that by 21 to 25 days after fertilization, the heart beats. 
that after 30 days, the baby has a brain and organs of unmistakable human proportions, that by seven weeks, the little one has individual, unique fingerprints, that at 12 weeks, baby is well aware of his or her environment and can close his fingers and open his mouth and move in response to sound. You see, you see Imogen, little donkey and twinkle, twinkle, little star were not wasted on your baby brother. The Lord called me, says Isaiah. From before my birth, from within the womb, he called me. The point that our text is making there is surely this. God knew James Timothy Lewis before his mom and dad did. That is the mystery of every human life. Now, Ed and Nikki may have named James, but God called him in the womb. God gave James his identity before the ultrasound scans picked him up, wriggling away there. God loved James before Imogen, remarkably, as you've told us, Nikki, turned to you that day last year and said, Mommy, Jesus has told me that I'm going to have a baby brother for Christmas. And uh, we know that her bond with James was powerful. And in the end, she was only out by a few days. You see, th these verses... These verses are part of a much bigger selection from the Bible which provide a framework that tells us that humanity bears the image of God from the earliest moments. That every life, however short, however vulnerable, is sacred and endowed with the dignity of the Creator. Yeah, just because James was formed in the womb with an additional copy of chromosome 18 did not make him less human. This is the mystery of life. James was a person. Though we never met him, we never heard him gurgle, we never watched him flex his fingers, he had life. But I want to push the mystery and wonder of life even further back than that. I want to suggest that James was a person in the mind and heart of God before he was an embryo, before he was a zygote, before he was a single cell. And I say that because of this extraordinary statement made by another Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah. Listen to his words. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. There's a brain teaser for all of us. God knew Jeremiah the prophet before he was even a twinkle in his parents' eyes. Jeremiah existed as a person in some way or other before he was conceived. Is it possible? That in a similar way, God knew James, loved James, before he formed him in the womb? Is it possible that God spoke those words over James' life? I know you. I know who you are. And I know what you will be. And I have a plan for you. You see, it's because of texts like that one and the one that you've put on the order of service, that we are able to say that there is ultimate meaning and purpose for every human life. And yes, there's mystery. The mystery of James' prenatal existence. It provokes wonder in us. The mystery of James' in utero existence provokes wonder in us. But then there is mystery in life which provokes pain in us. The mystery as to why God allowed James to be formed in the womb with Edward's syndrome and allowed James to die just before he was born. What can we say to that? Well, there are many things, friends, that I do not know. I can't fit the pieces together, but one thing I do know, God was not caught napping. 
When, when David writes of his own life there in Psalm 139, and he says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I suggest that applies as much to James Timothy Lewis as to any of us. And I think we need to hold on to that. God had a plan and purpose for James' life on earth, and that plan was completed all the day. days ordained for me were written in your book. Of course, of course, Nikki, of course, Ed. Of course we wish the plan had been different. James had a difficult, short life. But he had a life. And somehow, the brevity of his life is part of the mystery of life. One other thing to pick up on here. God's plan for James continues. Again, David in the psalm says, when I am awake, I am still with you. That is true for James. He is awake. Alive, no, more alive now than he has ever been. For he is with the Father, his creator, the savior in the kingdom of heaven. But, but, but of course, there is a paradox here. An undeniable tension. A, a tension in which we have somehow to hold two things together at the same time. It is, if you know it, it is in the nature of Christian faith to live with tension, to wrestle with it, not to deny it. For if on the one hand we have the mystery of life, on the other the tension is the reality of death. And that's the second thing I want to leave with us today. The mystery of life on the one hand in tension with the reality of death. We cannot avoid this, nor can we dress it up in some trite expression such as, well, death isn't really so bad. Yes, it is. Death is awful. It robs and separates us. It can leave us with regrets and the wounds of unanswerable questions. Death shatters our human illusion that we can overcome death like we can overcome everything else in life. So we overcome absence with phone calls or Skype calls. We overcome the heat of summer with air conditioning. We overcome distance by air travel. But we cannot overcome death. So what then can we say about death? this. Death is not how it was meant to be. Death is an alien intruder into God's once perfect world. The New Testament describes death as the last great enemy, the enemy to be overcome. And that's why Jesus, by the way, wept at the graveside of his friend Lazarus, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He wept because he knew that this was not how the world was meant to be. But we can also say this. Death is not how it's going to be either. Why, why such confidence? Why can we state that with such confidence? Because death has been defeated in the life of Christ. You may recall that just before Jesus raised Lazarus back to life, he said to the dead man's sisters, Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, Mary and Martha. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Wow. And then to demonstrate that Jesus had power over death, he walks to Lazarus' tomb, and he shouts over that tomb, come out and Lazarus did but there was more more to come follow the story of Jesus he dies on a cross is buried in a tomb but a few days later that tomb is empty Jesus 
is alive. So though death is a terrible reality, we are not defeated by it, ultimately. Through the crucifixion and resurrection of his son, God overcomes death. And notice that. Notice that. Notice that God knows what it is like to lose a son to death. The wounds of God speak to our wounds. The Sunday morning service here after James' death, I was standing there waiting to preach and we were singing one of the great contemporary hymns by Stuart Townend, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. And it was during the line that we sing in that hymn, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, that I, that I thought about James. And I began to struggle emotionally. You see, on the inside, I was reaching out for a way to make sense of his death from, from life's first cry. It's not that I didn't believe that to be so, it's that I was wrestling and struggling with the emotion of, well, what does that mean in James' case? He didn't have a first cry, though he did have a final breath. He never had a chance to cry. Or, or so I thought until in my research for, for today and in generally reflecting upon this issue, I discovered that a child may well cry in the womb too. It's one of the many things that babies can do in the womb. They develop, they develop certain tastes for certain foods in the womb. They react to stress. They practice facial expressions in the womb. They recognize nursery rhymes. And during the third trimester, apparently they silently cry. Their lower lip quivers. The mystery of life. It, it, it was for me, as we sang that hymn, as I struggled to come to a kind of emotion on it, it was for me one of several moments in this story of James' brief life when I found myself being real. Real about the pain. Real about the questions, the issues. Real. Human. So I finish today and my reflections with a, a children's story about being real. It comes from The Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams. You may well have heard of this. It's a novel about fabric animals and, and mechanized toys in a child's nursery. And the central character is the little velveteen rabbit who becomes real because a little boy loves him. Here's, here's part of the conversation between the velveteen rabbit and an old threadbare horse, skin horse, in the nursery. What is real? The velveteen rabbit asked the skin horse one day. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and, and a stick out handle? Real isn't how you're made, said the skin horse. It's the thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, or, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It, it takes a long time. That's why often it doesn't happen to people who break easily, or who have sharp edges, or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out. 
and you get loose in the joints and very, very shabby. But these things don't matter at all. Because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. What's the simple lesson? That we cannot become real unless we have loved, unless we have been loved, and unless we've been hurt. And, and the mystery of life, though it is wonderful, is that it can also be painful. It can break us. You, you loved James. You love James. And it hurts. But, but through him, you see, through him, you have become more real, more authentic, more human as a result. And I think that many of us have also become a little bit more real too in the process. Life is a mystery. Death, a reality. But God has overcome death for us in his son. In the life of Jesus, God became human. God became real. So that we might know his love and become real too. May God bless you. We're going to finish our service as we stand to sing that great traditional version of the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let me say, as the band find their places on the stage here, that we do want you to stay for tea and coffee and cakes and refreshments. There's a little table of items that I think you'll find interesting that tell something of James's life story. Please stay and uh, be part of the, uh, the family experience and expression of our love to the Lewises. But let's now stand and sing when I survey the wondrous cross.
we remain standing for prayer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant James. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace, now and always. Amen.